So let's do the same drill um, with panitumumab. Now, um, in, in the U.S. at least, the only approval we have is single agent. Um, our guidelines give us permission, of course, all over the map. Um, so, um, uh, Heinz, let's start with you. Um, how does, where, where and when um, is a patient where you're going to give panitumumab? Uh, in the same place, then I would put cetuximab. For the reasons I mentioned before, I think for toxicity profile, I usually prefer cetuximab, but I don't have another patient population. I use the EGF receptor inhibitors in the same place. Do you get in much trouble from the guy from Aetna um, when you're no. combining panitumumab with uh, chemotherapy? No, I don't. Johanna, this is your drug of choice because of infusion right. reaction. Right. right, and so I'll use it anywhere that I would use cetuximab. And again, no similar, no problem with uh, insurance, or do you have to fight that sometimes? Because uh, you've got pretty strict guidelines. Very that you strict guidelines. Um, so sometimes you have to fight, but usually you can get it through, but yeah. it's getting tougher. It is good. I mean, I've had these discussions with uh, uh, the, the guy or gal who works for the insurance company. Um, you know, that says, well, it's only approved as a single agent, um, and so if you give it every other week, then they don't catch on. But anyway, that's uh, <laughs> another, another trick. Does panitubumab factor into your day-to-day -day, uh, No, treatment? I mean, I've used them interchangeably as well. I mean, the, the nice thing about panitubumab, you don't have to pre-med, and, and uh, so I've, I've been using panitumumab and cetuximab, and I don't have to, I, I, I can't say that there's a big, big difference, probably a little bit more skin side effect. Do you regorafen, do you uh, uh, drop the dose uh, of, of a panitubumab, no, sorry? No, So you give that full dose even though it might be a bit high? Correct. And when you get into the toxicity, how do you manage dose, uh, uh, the, the toxicity of, you know, if you get a skin reaction? Well, so we, we, we prevent, we, we go every, every out of our way to try to prevent the rash, as Marwan said in the beginning. So we were very aggressive with topicals and with antibiotics. And who does that education? In your our system? nurse practitioners. Yeah. Everybody, if it's mostly yeah. nursing, we follow the step protocol. It do is. you do it yourselves? I mean, do you, in the, when you're offering this up to a patient, do you have a strategy when you're presenting the drug and the and the rash? Yeah, yeah. Because we, we, I don't know if we have packages and then we sit down, either it's the NP or myself, and we say this is what you have to do. We give the prescription of the antibiotics and the topical, and they can start right away and. I, I don't so I literally open up the picture on, from the internet of a grade three yeah. rash with the bar across the face. Yeah, the, the, and as if you don't and know who I that say, is. if you don't do this, oh my God. you'll look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do. It works, works like a charm. So you all are not that, no, that mean, I that. see. I'm, I'm, I'm a vicious, uh, I see. All right. Um, OK, switching gears a little bit to regorafenib. Um, and um, Marwan, why don't you start? So where does this drug? Um, let's say in the absence of um, early phase clinical trials, where does it fit uh, for first, let's, let's make it a, a, a KRAS mutated metastatic colon? All right, so it, it, in, in, in my patients with KRAS mutation, it fits after failure of chemotherapy and after most of those patients who have stopped full FOX, stopped full FOX also because of neuropathy or you stop them at four months. So probably they've seen full FOX, five a few, full FOX of Vastin, five a few Vastin uh, maintenance, uh, full theory plus Flibrisat or full theory plus Bevacizumab. Then probably I'll go back to rechallenge with full FOX if they haven't failed full FOX. So I've now established not only, res you know, that they've got those drugs, but they're refractory to those drugs. So last resort, no good option of clinical trial, good performance status, discuss results of toxicity, and then offer it to the patient. So this is a very common practice pattern we've learned, is that the rechallenge again, comes before the drug that has an OS. Is this your practice? Is this what you're doing? You're going to play all the chemo out first before you go uh, to this? Yeah, I definitely want to make sure that I've, I've used or squeezed every drop that I possibly can out of the So based on what? I mean, is re-challenge, re yeah, you can get a response again, but is there any survival data with a re-challenge? Not to my knowledge. I think the issues with re-challenging with oxaliplatin is it, the presence or absence of neuropathy. So many patients, in our experience, uh, patients who've had, uh, let's say, intervening surgery and anesthesia may have worsening neuropathy. Many times the neuropathy gets worse over time. I won't rechallenge a patient with oxali if they've got a, a neuropathy because you might get a dose or two in and then they'll have it worse. The critical question is why did they come off in the first place? If they came off with stable disease to give them a rest, I totally agree. If they came off for early neuropathy that's totally resolved, I might go to it. 
And the, and the reason is, again, because I don't think we're enthused with our alternative uh, treatment is, is, the honest, uh, is the honest reason. Yeah, I, I agree. Let me clarify what, what we do is basically typical of what we is recommended with NCCN, which is basically drop oxalian metastatic setting before you get the grade 3 neuropathy. So these are patients where you're doing pretty much a stop and go, but you're really not doing stop and go unless you go, the, your go back is really a while later. Right. So, so these are patients who stopped after four months, eight cycles, and don't have grade three neuropathy. Those are the patients who are candidate for a re-challenge, in my opinion, not refractory to oxaliplatin. Heinz, is there, is KRAS matter, RAS matter, and is there any biomarker for regorafenib at the moment? No, we so don't. So it's all comers. Yeah. Performance status, right, probably very important. I think so, yeah. And then if we have a, a K or a RAS wild type patient, I'm assuming this drug comes into play one later line of therapy. Mm -hmm. But back to this rechallenge and the like is, you know, are we talking about if one EGFR didn't work, you'd try the other one first? Are we talking about, you know, we're seeing a lot of single agent of Flibercept being tried out yeah. there. Um, you know, is this Cape Cyta being a Flibercep first before regular? Is this what's happening? Or? Yeah, I, I think um, we don't really know the introduction of chemotherapy, which maybe have not failed or have failed a long time ago, is that better than a potential with um, um, regorafenib? I think we don't. What we know and what we learn more and more that the um, molecular changes happen under treatment. So you can make a tumor sensitive again, even you failed Folfox, treat it for a long time with Folfiri. These surviving cells may become sensitive to oxalplatin again. So I think we learn more and more, but there are no biomarkers for Stivaga. Um, and or for recovafenib, there are no really understanding what is the best next step for in, in introducing chemotherapy again based on the previous treatment. So I think we are just learning that some of them may work again with the reintroduction of cytotoxic and target agents. Okay. I start at 160, watch them weekly, um, check labs weekly, um, keep an eye on them, warn them, do a lot of frontline education. Your starting dose? I'm starting still at 80, but 80. But seeing them the next week, if they do well, bump okay. it up. Um, the performance zero, 160, the other one, 120. So if they're all, okay, so very, so you're looking at that patient and saying, okay. Same thing as Heinz. So 160, 160 one, 120 zero, if it's one, a little frailer? Yeah, exactly. Almost always at 80, and we see them weekly and go up as, as they do in Tennessee, I guess. Yeah, and, <laughs> and just a, another consensus moment yeah. for us uh, up here as a panel. So basically the gang out there watching can do whatever, whatever they want. Um, 80 is the minimum dose apparently. Um, so let's do um, uh, one more build another patient scenario. We've got this chest piece called Zivaflibercept. Um, it is a VEGF inhibitor. We've described it. It has approval in second line with a survival advantage. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's, is there a particular patient um, where one would pick um, a flibercept, Zivaflibercept, over, let's say, Bevacizumab? Let's be very specific in second line. Alan, is there a, can you draw me up a patient where you would say, yeah, this is a patient where I would do a flibber set beyond progression? How much time do we have here? No, <laughs> just, is there one? No, is there, I, I, I actually, I, I have trouble figuring out exactly which patient I would do that in. The behavior of, of prescribing Zivaflibercept means not prescribing Bev, and, and so that, uh, it's, for me, I'm not sure where that niche would be. So let me, let me, be, let me paint one then. Let's say it's uh, you know, two months in, um, uh, or three months, whenever your first imaging is, um, KRAS mutated tumor, um, full Fox Bev, and has had progression. Okay, significant tumor burden. Um, uh, is this a wholesale substitution of, you know, you know, change your floral perimeter and change your, your ox to eerie, change your VEGF in the hopes? Is this a patient where that well, might that, come into play? That would be a reasonable scenario where you, you're, you're beside yourself and you have one more bite of the apple probably. That might be a time to use it. Yeah. Others? Second line. I, I agree with your scenario. I think uh, when we look at the survival benefit in second line, there seemed to be no difference between continuing Bevacizumab versus Aflipacept. The toxicity profile is in benefit of Bev, but I think if somebody progresses quickly to 
Befasusumab treat or under Befasusumab, I think that is a possibility. I think the biggest challenge, and I, I hope that um, we will find potential biomarkers because the curves look really promising on um, maybe we find something where we dis distinguish and differentiate the mechanism of actions that give us an idea of when to use when. But right now, only the patient population you just described. So if you're taking care of a movie star who, who can't have a rash, is there a time when you might use uh, uh, a second line even in a wild type? Yeah, hmm. absolutely. Hmm. That's a, actually a very good example, <laughs> okay? Um, and it doesn't have to be a movie star. It yeah. could be an anchor man. It could be an anchor okay? man, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. Th you know, everything where your, your face is very important and your skin, you think twice what you can do and what to toxicity you can tolerate. So I'm really hearing that this is, it, it, we, we acknowledge its benefit. There's no question about that. But it's really a toxicity kind of profile. So if we learned how to manage that better, it would have an increasing use and role. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the other <coughs> question would be if you have a good performance status patient uh, who's young and, and even if it's six months through with progression, do I know if I should switch to a Fliberset or not? And, you know, preclinically these, these work differently on xenografts, but does it translate to the clinic? I honestly don't know, but I, I, may, I may actually make the transition even in somebody who progressed up to six months. Uh, but definitely I do it for somebody with a very early progression of two to four months. Very good.